Please welcome from NBC News and MSNBC, Stephanie Rule. The airline industry has been turned on its head by the coronavirus pandemic. So the big question is, how does the industry survive at a time when few people are traveling for business or pleasure? How can it restore the confidence in the public that flying is actually safe? To discuss the state of the airline industry and how it will move forward, we are joined by the CEO of Delta Airlines, Ed Bastian. Ed, thank you so much for being with us. Good to um, be with you, Stephanie. Let's start with the state of... Uh, let's start with the state of the industry. No pun intended. It has been quite a trip. As far as the recovery goes, where's the industry? It has been quite a trip, and we are solidly in the recovery phase of that trip, though we have a ways to go till we get to our destination. Today, we're traveling and carrying volumes at about 30 percent of what we were this time a year ago. Uh, the Labor Day holiday was the busiest holiday. If you look at Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, successive improvements in the overall volumes that we're carrying, but we still have a long ways to go. International is obviously considerably behind domestic, and a lot of the travel that's going on now is leisure as compared to business. Is there a, a goal, is there a point in time where you can see yourselves getting back to 80 or 100 percent? Absolutely. I have no doubt that we're going to get back to where we were. It's just going to take some time. Restoring confidence is our number one priority through this and the, the, having consumers that are willing to uh, travel. That's not a problem. People are interested in travel. It's the confidence they have, not just in the flight experience, but the, the businesses aren't open. So there's no reason to go to visit a customer or the sales conventions aren't being held or the theme parks may not be open. So the entire travel ribbon has to open, not just the airline uh, component of it. Um, do you see business travel coming back, Ed? As you said, a lot of things aren't open, but even when they do, a lot of companies have realized they can get a lot of business done staying at home. I think business travel will come back. I don't know that it'll come back to the level it was in 2019. I do think there's a piece of business travel that will be replaced by video tools uh, because of the forced adaptation. We have no option. Uh, it, we'd much rather do this, this conference in person than uh, through all the technology channels and the glitches that we have to experience sometimes in putting these on. But the reality is the spirit wants to be with each other. Collaboration occurs, relationships get solidified, new opportunities are created when we're together. And there's a, a strong desire when we talk to all of our corporates that they want to get back out on the road. They want to go see their customers. So video technology is a substitute, but I think it's a poor substitute substitute and the bulk of travel, business travel will come back, but it's going to take some time. Let's talk about the safe customer experience. In July, you said no mask, no Delta. At that point, you had over 100 names of people who weren't going to be welcome flying on Delta if they didn't adhere to the policies. What has happened since then? Well, we continue to, to enforce that policy, and today we're up to 350 people who we've had to put on the no-fly list because of their refusal to wear a mask once they get on board. Uh, you know, masks are the most important thing that we have to protect ourselves and to protect others in the face of the virus. And at Delta, we're using many layers of protection, the quality of the air, the filtration systems, we're capping load factors, we're blocking middle seats, we're electrostatically fogging every seat, every surface before every single flight takes off. But the mask is the core component of making certain that we keep our, our hygiene and, and the virus and any concerns around the virus contained. And so on board our planes, we are insistent that people wear masks. And occasionally we do find people that don't want to wear it and that's okay. And then we, we offload them and we make certain that they don't fly Delta again. How hard has that been to enforce for your flight attendants? It was hard initially because you, we don't want our flight attendants to be a form of a security uh, a cop or police state trying to trying to monitor the cabin. But realize we're an industry that's that's it, it adheres to rules and compliance. It's just the same as if you didn't want to wear your seatbelt on takeoff or landing or you wanted to stand up while we're on the tarmac. We wouldn't allow for that either. And what you see, Stephanie, is that the customers themselves police it. 
because if you know uh, all of our customers want to make certain that everyone is following this rule more than any other rule we have and so the flight attendants get support from customers when they they run into the occasional obstinate traveler which are very very few we we carried last week over a million customers and we had only 25 or so people that we put on the no fly list last week so it's a very very small number but our people do a great job of that have you been flying delta do you feel safe to fly Absolutely. I've, I've flown every week throughout the pandemic. I can tell you not only do I feel safe, the experience is the best it's ever been. Uh, we rate our customer surveys, the satisfaction scores are really high. We're now our net promoter scores are 75 this summer. Last summer, we, we were at 50 and 50 was a very good number for a company of our scale. We're up to 75. So customers are telling us this is absolutely the best time to travel. There's apprehension when people get back out into the airports and, the, and travel because it's new, it's different. But after the first uh, tr trip or two, people are telling, and the lot, there's a lot of anecdotal word of mouth, people are saying it's the right time to get out and travel, and they're encouraging their peers to do the same. You mentioned blocking the middle seat and other safety precautions. You have taken more significant safety measures than other airlines have. That's expensive. Has it helped or hurt your bottom line? It's not helped the bottom line. We're, we're flying today uh, at a 60% load factor cap, so that means 40% of the seats we fly, we are deliberately not selling and not filling. That is not cheap. But the more important decision we make is we got to put people over profits, that we know that instilling confidence in our customers as well as our own employees is job number one. That's our priority right now. And that when people are, are feeling comfortable and want to sit in the middle seat, we will sell it again. It's not going to happen this year. Probably sometime next year, we'll, we'll get back to that point where there are vaccines and inoculations and medical advances that people feel confident in traveling again. But I'd, I'd much rather people remember Delta as the company that took care of them through the pandemic than was, was putting profits and trying to fill the seats up before customers were ready for it. My, uh, my boss, the chairman of Delta, Frank Blake, a good friend said to me at the start of the pandemic that to remind me crises don't build character, crises reveal character. And customers are making a decision about who Delta is by the values that we put out on display every day. And our customers appreciate it and our people appreciate it and they all will remember it. Customers will, but how hard is it for you to stick to that? People over profits is an important mission, but it's not something that shareholders like to hear. How much pressure are you under to bring back that middle seat, get rid of some of these ex expensive precautions? Well, it's uh, right now, I think our customers, uh, excuse me, our shareholders understand. Uh, when we look at the level of cash burn, that's how we're measuring. We're not, we don't have profits. None of, no one in the airline industry today has profits. We look at our cash burn. Our cash burn is actually as good or if not better than the other, the other airlines we're competing against, despite the fact that we're not selling 40% of the seats. So I think from a shareholder perspective, they realize we're making an investment in the future by not selling those seats and we're not being inordinately disadvantaged because customers are rewarding us with their loyalty and their preference during this, these times. You've also said that you will not have layoffs for flight attendants or ground workers. How can you afford to do that? Is it because the government support you received? Well, the government did provide us support that carried us through for the six months following the start of the pandemic. That support expires at the end of this month, at the end of September. And at that point, the industry is facing some pretty large furlough risks uh, through many of, many of the airlines. At Delta, one of the things that we've done is that we've had enormous volunteerism. Uh, we've had up to 40,000 of our employees, almost half our entire employee base, take months of unpaid leave uh, at a time. So we've been able to offset almost 50% of all of our cost by those employees during this last six months, just by saying that we're not going to, we're, we're not going to fly. We'll stay home. We'll, we'll save the company that money. It's saving jobs for other people. We also had another 20% of our employees agree to early retire. We had a, had a nice early retirement package. So we had close to 17,000 people take those packages over the last couple of months. So the employees at Delta are stepping up and they're making the tough decisions for themselves to put jobs 
first, and if they could step aside to let another employee keep their job who needed it, they're doing that in the pandemic. And then many of the people decided to retire to allow the next generation to step up and have those opportunities. So as a result of that, we were able to save almost half of our labor bill during this period of time without involuntarily furloughing or reducing rates or any, of, of any nature. So I'm really proud of the team. It, it speaks to the character again of, of who we are. Culture is everything. Um, when you think about the economy at large, right, you, you travel around the world. We talk about this recovery and it's very fragmented and fragile. How do you see things beyond just you know, your it, specific company in the airline industry? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to read. Uh, it, it is fragile. I would, I would agree with that. Right now, it's certainly being benefited by the amount of liquidity that's in the market as the Fed has opened up stimulus programs and the, the Fed has provided trillions of dollars into the economy. So there's a question of how sustainable some of that uh, recovery is at the moment. Uh, our business, as we know, has is, is been decimated. I think many of the businesses in the hospitality and leisure sector have been inordinately hurt much worse than many others. You've got winners. You've got the Amazons. You've got the electronic uh, firms that have, have actually taken advantage of the opportunity. But you have many, many people that are hurting. You know, the unemployment uh, roles in this country are large and uh, it's unclear when we get to the other side of some of the stimulus programs what the real state of the economy is going to be. When your government support runs out, are you going to be asking for more? The industry is looking for more, an extension for six months. I don't know that we will receive it. Uh, the reason for that is to avoid those layoffs that we talked about. At Delta, we, we are facing layoffs as well. We've got about 2,000 pilots that we haven't been able to, to make great progress with our union on. So there, there is a risk of furloughs at some, some portion of Delta. But across the industry, you're looking at tens of thousands of people facing layoff notices October 1st if the government doesn't come through with an extension. So it's hard, it's hard to predict. Um, you know, right now we've taken matters into our own hands. We didn't want to run the risk of, of whether the government would decide to, to support us or not. So the Delta people have, have made the decisions to save the jobs and take, take time off. Uh, we've seen in the news a scathing report around the 737 Max, uh, and really accusing the FAA and Boeing of having too cozy a relationship and blaming them for those awful crashes. While Delta didn't fly that fleet, back in January, you said you hope to see it back in the sky. Do you still feel that way? Yeah, I still hope to see that plane in the sky. And I'm confident when it is approved and the regulators have had a chance to thoroughly inspect the aircraft, it will probably be the safest aircraft that's received the most attention of any aircraft ever built. Uh, you know, we don't fly the plane, as you say, but I do. I think it's it's not good for the industry to have these types of issues, whether we fly the plane or not. I do have confidence in Boeing, though we're disappointed in, in what, uh, what came out of the report, not just on the Boeing side, but also the regulatory side as to where the breakdowns that had occurred. Should consumers out there feel confident in our regulators, in the FAA? We assume they're working for us. And when you read a report like that, you start to think, uh, it seems like they're working for the industry. Well, two things on that. First, air travel in the United States is the safest form of transportation in the world of any form of transportation. So uh, yes, everyone should feel safe, absolutely safe being on an airplane. That's at the core of what we are. Our, we don't rely on the regulators to, to, monitor, to, to, to gauge the safety of our aircraft. We take that responsibility in the airline industry ourselves. The regulators reinforce that, they ensure compliance and they check on all the safety protocols that we deploy. There's an important element of this, though, Stephanie, we have to be careful about. If we put too much of a divide between the regulators and the OEM, say Boeing or the airlines, sometimes you get into, you, you, want, you want compliance, you want transparency, you want everybody having full access to all of the information and people volunteering when they see a problem. You don't want anyone in that chain holding something back for fear of what's going to mean. We want everybody to cooperate and provide as open and visible a, a signal if, when anytime you, you face a risk factor. And that's what the compliance of the FAA has provided. And that's why we do have as safe a culture as we do. 
the, the, the Max is a one-off. I can't explain it. I, I'm not part of it. I've, I've watched it. I've been as disappointed in the learnings. I think there were some motivations there to try to minimize pilot training or minimize the cost of, of upgrading the, the from a 7.3 NG to a Max, so make it easier for the industry to to to, to purchase and, and implement the, the new technology faster. That was disappointing to find out. The refs shouldn't be the enemy, but they also shouldn't be our friends. They're here to make us better and safer. I do want to ask you Absolutely. about climate change for a moment. Right now, in the South, we've got uh, enormous flooding. In the West, we've got fires. There is a call to action when it comes to climate change. Do you expect to see commercial planes that do not rely on fossil fuels in our lifetime? I don't. I think that technology will come someday. Uh, the uh, the electrification using using different uh, sustainable aviation fuels and other other forms of energy at some point I think right now that it's cost prohibitive uh, at Delta we announced before the pandemic though we're holding to it a billion dollar commitment to invest in offset technology new new technologies to eliminate the footprint that we create over the next 10 years going forward uh, so we're working and we're providing that the, uh, the level of investment in, in the new technologies, but it's gonna take some time before that comes about. I do wanna ask what this has been like for you. I mean, this has been a brutal time for all of us from a health and an economic perspective and a cultural perspective. What has it been like for you? Has it changed you as a leader? It has. I think every aspect of the pandemic has impacted all of us, our daily walk, our, our uh, relationships, uh, what we do, uh, our priorities in life. Uh, at Delta, we were at the highest high, best performing airline in the globe last year and coming off of a very high and going down right down to the bottom. And, and you know, the last 10 years of everything we built was decimated. So there was initial, there was some discouragement and disillusion, which you can't help. But we quickly picked ourselves up and realized that our future is still ahead of us. And our company is a great company. We provide essential service. We provide critical services. That's one of the reasons why the government supported us during the pandemic, because they wanted to keep the airways open and keep people moving, and we are doing that. But also our company needs us like never before. And so Delta is a 95-year-old company. I tell our leadership team at all times, our company needs our leadership now more than any leadership team in our history. And we're going to pick this company up and we're going to put her back to her position of prominence where she belongs. And that's our charge. And so we're working hard to do just that. It's a marathon. This is not this is going to take time. This is not a sprint. But we're, we're, we're on the right path. And while we're only at 30 percent of the way through the journey, we're going to get to the other end of this. Well, the only way we're going to get through this, Ed, is if we do it together. Thank you Absolutely. so much for joining me. I really appreciate it.